All right, guys, so today we're talking about the shoulder complex. Now, in terms of the shoulder complex, we're going to be looking at some specific bones that that includes. We're going to start by talking about the different joints involved at our shoulder and then go into some more specifics about muscles and different features of those joints. So first off, our shoulder complex. Of course, it includes our upper limb, mainly the humerus here, which is attaching to our scapula. So we have our humerus, the big bone in our upper arm right here, and that attaches to the scapula. So we have our scapula here. Interesting thing about the scapula is, did you know that this bone is so wafer thin in the body that it's actually um, translucent in many people? So our very thin scapula. And then we have this landmark right here, which is where the head of the humerus is going to sit, being the glenoid fossa. So the glenoid fossa meets with the head of the humerus. Now, another interesting thing about the scapula is that when we look at this model, we see at the back here, the scapula is sort of like drilled into the ribs here. Like, but in actual fact, the scapula and the ribs aren't attached. So if these drills weren't here, the scapula is actually floating in our back. So it's not attached to any bone. The only place where our upper limb is actually attached to our trunk is at the sternoclavicular joint so the other bone of our shoulder girdle being the clavicle here and the clavicle the clavicle attaching to that acromion of the scapula so remember the clavicle attaches here running across and connecting our limb to our trunk right here at the manubrium of the sternum or the sternoclavicular joint so three key bones we're going to look at today. The humerus is a long bone, the scapula and the clavicle are both flat bones as well. So let's first start off by talking about some joints. So the first joint that we're going to discuss is this sternoclavicular joint. It's the most important one because it joins the limb to the trunk, right? There's no other place where that happens. Now, what that means is that the clavicle and the scapula really move with our upper limb to allow actions of the shoulder girdle and our actions of the glenohumeral joint. And it's something that we take for granted a bit is that how much range we have at the glenohumeral and shoulder girdle joints. Our shoulder is a really movable joint, um, but I guess the trade-off between being a very movable or a very... Um, or, or a joint with a lot of range is that it's not a very stable joint. So a lot of shoulder dislocations, um, a lot of shoulder injuries occur because it's not a, such a stable joint compared to like the hip, say, where the head of the femur is really contained by that acetabulum. In this case, the shoulder is not stable, but it does have very, very good range. So sternoclavicular joint <clears throat> really allows for these actions of the shoulder girdle. So if you were to put your fingers on your sternoclavicular joints just at the bottom of your throat there, you can feel it elevating and depressing. So you can feel as your clavicle goes up and down and you can feel as your um, clavicle moves backwards and forwards during um, retraction and protraction. There's also a bit of rotation occurring there. And that's because this is a shallow saddle joint. So you'll remember from structural anatomy that the sternoclavicular joint is synovial, saddle or shallow saddle, diathrotic, multi-axial. So that multi-axial is the key because most saddle joints are biaxial. But because of how shallow this is, it means it's a multi-axial joint. And there's actually another important feature of this sterno, uh, sternoclavicular joint that allows it to move the way it does. And that's a fibrocartilage meniscus. And you can see in your lab books today at the sternoclavicular joint, there's a fibrocartilage meniscus between the sternum and the clavicle. And a meniscus helps to suction in the two bones together. So it helps to provide stability to the joint. And it needs the stability because pretty much the whole weight of your arm is relying on this sternoclavicular joint to not pop off. If you're carrying something heavy, of course, you've got the muscles also contributing to the stability, but 
all of that weight, or not all of it, but a lot of that weight is being concentrated on that sternoclavicular joint. And because of that fibrocartilage meniscus, we don't actually often see many um, clavicle dislocations. A clavicle fracture is a much is much more common than a clavicle dislocation, and um, potentially some of that is attributed to the fibrocartilage meniscus at the sternoclavicular joint. Now the next joint um, we should discuss, let's move along from the clavicle and now look at the joint between the clavicle and the scapula that occurs at the acromion of the scapula here. So if I put my scapula up to myself, the clavicle will run across and insert at that acromion. Now this is called the acromioclavicular joint. Um, oftentimes people get this one confused because they think the joint between the scapula and the clavicle, it's got to be the scapuloclavicular joint, but it's not. It's the exact location of the scapula that we're interested in, which is the acromion. So the acromion and the scapula come together to create the acromioclavicular joint. This is often terms called the AC joint, and it's a very common location of injury um, to many contact sport players. So if you've got any um, rugby players um, in the room, you probably have a friend who's done their AC joint. And what ends up happening is, I, I'm sorry, I don't have a clavicle to show you, that's why I'm using my finger. But what ends up happening is the clavicle just pops off the top of that acromion. So often you, it looks all normal, but then there'll just be this raised edge here being the clavicle because it's no longer attached to the acromion. And what's really interesting is, is you can just press down that end of the clavicle like a piano key. So if you know anyone who's got it, ask them if they'll let you play with it and you can just pop it down and it pops back up like that. It's kind of gross, but also very interesting. <laughs> Um, so that's our chromioclavicular joint. It's a plane joint, so synovial, plane, diarthrotic, non-axial. Now, the other joint that we're going to talk about, we're going to come back to the glenohumeral, but there's one more thing I want to talk to you about, and it's this, I guess, it's a type of articulation between the scapula and the ribs. Now, the scapula doesn't lie directly on the ribs. It's not bone to bone contact. So this is a, not a normal type of joint. That's why in your lab books, you can see it's called scapulothoracic articulation. Now, there's actually muscles and um, fascia, there's connective tissue running down between the scapula and the ribs that prevent bone being on bone. But, and again, like I said, the scapula is actually just floating in our backs. It's not actually attached to anything apart from the humerus. But because we have this interesting sort of connection between the scapula and the rib cage, we call this the scapulothoracic articulation. Now, up until this point, we've spoken about the glenohumeral joint and the shoulder girdle. Those have been our two areas of interest um, when it comes to the shoulder complex. Now, what we're learning here is that the shoulder girdle is not actually just one specific thing. The shoulder girdle is actually a combination of the three joints that we've just spoken about. So the shoulder girdle includes the sternoclavicular joint, the acromioclavicular joint, and the scapulothoracic joint. So the sternoclavicular joint and the acromioclavicular joint move together with this scapulothoracic articulation to allow movements of the shoulder girdle. So elevation, depression, protraction, retraction, and then also upward and downward rotation, which looks like this for upward rotation and downward rotation. Now, this is also referred to as um, medial and lateral rotation. So upward rotation is also known as lateral rotation. And then downward rotation is also known as medial rotation as I come back down. All right, so those are the joints of the shoulder complex or the shoulder girdle, sorry. So one, two, three, sternoclavicular, acromioclavicular, scapulothoracic articulation. Then we have our glenohumeral joint. So our glenohumeral joint is a very interesting joint. We know it's a synovial joint. We know it's a ball and socket. So synovial, diarthrotic, 
ball and socket multi-axial. So there's many, many, many movements that occur at the glenohumeral joint. We can flex it, extend it, abduct, adduct, um, horizontally adduct, horizontally abduct, and then also medial rotation of the humerus and lateral rotation of the humerus as well. And then if we put a few of those together, we get our circumduction too. <clears throat> so lots of different movements at the glenohumeral joint. Now, <clears throat> as I was saying before, the glenohumeral joint is a very mobile joint. If you flex your glenohumeral joint, you can lift your arm right, off, right up. If you extend it in hyperextension, you can get a lot of range there and compared to the hip, <clears throat> there's quite a lot of range at the glenohumeral joint. Now, the problem with that is it's not very good at stability. If you look at where the glenoid fossa is and the size of the glenohumeral, uh, of the humerus head, that glenohumeral joint is literally like a golf ball on a tee. So this being the tee and this being the golf ball, there's not much bone to bone contact. And <clears throat> that is one of the reasons why we see so many shoulder injuries, so see so many shoulder dislocations. Now, there is a feature of the glenohumeral joint that we haven't spoken about up until now that helps to provide a lot of stability at this joint, and it is called the glenoid labrum. Now, the labrum is like a rim of fibrocartilage that surrounds the glenoid fossa. So it's called the glenoid labrum. It's a rim of fibrocartilage surrounding that glenoid fossa. And it helps to suction in the head of the humerus because otherwise, you know, there's not going to be much joint stability there at all. Now, the um, glenoid labrum deepens the cavity and sucks in the head of the humerus. Uh, the glenoid labrum actually increases the depth of the glenoid cavity by 50%. And it really works as a suction. So it's like sucks it in there, makes it harder to come out. And um, we've also got one at the hip joint as well. So we'll be talking about that when we get to the hip. So that's the glenoid labrum. It's a very important feature of the glenohumeral joint. Helps to provide stability. Now... What I want to talk about next are the major muscles of the glenohumeral joint. So talking specifically about our glenohumeral joint here. Now, <clears throat> when we think about the big muscles of the glenohumeral joint, the first one for me that comes to mind is the deltoid or the shoulder muscle. Now, unfortunately, I have the muscle arm uh, or the muscles of the arm here that I seem to not have taken home. The deltoid unfortunately so the deltoid you can imagine it's here it's that big muscle that creates that dome shape of the shoulder the deltoid is a multi pennate muscle so it's got fibers running in all different directions it's got like little slits of connective tissue throughout it which means there's fibers at the front running downwards on the side there's more fibers and then even on the back there's fibers coming down in like a diagonal direction as well. Now, the main action of the deltoid muscle is in abduction of the glenohumeral joint. That's probably its main action. And it's an agonist of abduction at the glenohumeral joint. There's also another muscle which does abduction of the glenohumeral joint, and that's a muscle that lies within our rotator cuff. So, before I talk about that, the rotator cuff muscles are very, very important because like I was saying before, the shoulder complex is only really attached to the axial skeleton at this one point here being the sternoclavicular joint. Now, if you're carrying a really heavy, you know, thing of groceries, I said there was a lot of load on this sternoclavicular joint. And the one muscle group that really helps with stabilizing the shoulder joint or the glenohumeral joint is our rotator cuff. So four muscles of the rotator cuff being the subscapularis right here, the supraspinatus, the infraspinatus and the teres minor. So these four muscles really, along with that glenoid labrum, help to stabilize the glenohumeral joint. And we were talking about abduction, so the deltoid being an agonist of abduction. The other muscle that also does abduction is our supraspinatus, so superior to the spine of the scapula, 
this muscle here is going to abduct the glenohumeral joint. And that one is actually also an agonist of abduction. An interesting thing about where we see multiple agonists of a joint is that it's not always because they're both agonists no matter what. Actually, in this example at the glenohumeral joint, from zero to 30 degrees of abduction, so from um, anatomical position to 30 degrees of abduction, it's actually my supraspinatus that initiates this movement. So from zero to 30 degrees, the supraspinatus is the main agonist. Then from 30 degrees and above, it's really all in the deltoid. So this is an example of where actually muscles are agonists at different points within a movement. And that's because of um, their orientation. So from zero to 30, it's the supraspinatus. Then from 30 and above, it becomes pretty much all deltoid. And what's really interesting is that if you see someone with an injury to their rotator cuff and an injury specifically to the supraspinatus is that if you get them to stand with their arms by their side and you say, okay, now can you abduct your arm from here? They won't be able to do it. They'll struggle with the injury to the supraspinatus. But if you take their arm and you place it at greater than 30 degrees of abduction, so you've placed it here for them and you say, okay, now can you abduct your arm? no problems, right? Because the deltoid is taken over. So they often have trouble initiating that abduction movement when they have an injury to that um, supraspinatus muscle. So from zero to 30, supraspinatus is the agonist. From 30 and above, it becomes the deltoid, which is the agonist of that action. Now, then we have the latissimus dorsi. So let's talk about the latissimus dorsi, another big muscle of the glenohumeral joint. It comes from our um, back here, up, up, up through the ribs, and it actually comes under your underarm and inserts onto the front of the humerus. Now, latissimus dorsi, sometimes called the swimmer's muscle. If you go look at pictures of Michael Phelps, he's got these big wings out the side here. So big latissimus dorsi. That's because, oh, excuse me. It's a very important muscle for glenohumeral extension. So swimming, swimming, swimming. You put your arm through the water and you have to extend it back down with the force. That's going to be all latissimus dorsi doing that. That's a major muscle of extension. The deltoid also does it as well. But um, latissimus dorsi is our big glenohumeral joint extender. Then we have the pectoralis major. So pectoralis major, a big chest muscle. Let's have a look at it here. So a big chest muscle being the pectoralis major. Again, you can see it's got fibers running in quite a dip few different directions. So some coming um, downwards from the clavicle, some coming horizontally from the sternum, and then upwards from the ribs. Now, pec um, major inserts into the front of the humerus in the same place as the latissimus dorsi does. And its main action is horizontal adduction. So if you think about those horizontal fibers of the pec major, they're going to contract to bring your arm through horizontally like so. So horizontal adduction, like if you're going to do this, punching as well. So not the serratus anterior this time, but if we think about punching at the pectoralis major, horizontal adduction is really important. And it also does adduction of the glenohumeral joint. So Pectoralis major and latissimus dorsi are both um, agonists of adduction at the glenohumeral joint. And adduction at the glenohumeral joint is actually the only action that the deltoid does not do. And it makes sense because the deltoid wraps around the pretty much the whole glenohumeral joint. So it makes sense that it's got lots of different actions at that joint but it doesn't do adduction. And the reason that is, is because to adduct the glenohumeral joint, the muscle is gonna to have to be on the inside of the joint somewhere. And that's the really the only place that the deltoid doesn't go. So the deltoid wraps around the front, the outside and the back, but it doesn't go on the inside of that joint like the pectoralis major and the latissimus dorsi do. So that's an interesting fact for you. They both are agonists of adduction, pec major and um, latissimus dorsi. The other thing that pec major does, and also latissimus dorsi, 
and also a rotator cuff muscle being the subscapularis is medial rotation. Now I like to think of medial rotation as, um, <clears throat> what's it called? When you fight someone, you do um, arm wrestling. So these are the muscles of arm wrestling. So you're going like this, you grab someone's arm and you're gonna turn it inwards. That's the medial rotation there. And if you were to arm wrestle with someone right now, you'd probably feel it hurting a bit at the shoulder. That's probably the subscapularis. You'd probably feel your pec major switch on and you gotta beat that person. So the pec major is gonna be a big helper in medial rotation. Even doing this right now, I can feel my pec major contracting. Uh, latissimus dorsi is gonna help with that as well. So those are the you know three main muscles that do medial rotation. They're big muscles that do medial rotation. The pec, the latissimus dorsi, the subscapularis. <clears throat> then if we think about the muscles that do lateral rotation, though that's our um, infraspinatus and our teres minor. Um, really, they're small muscles. So what's going to be stronger, medial rotation or lateral rotation? Medial rotation. Medial rotation is much, much, much stronger than lateral rotation. It is actually three to two. So the ratio between the medial rotators and the lateral rotators is three to two. So three for medial rotation, two for lateral rotation. If you look elsewhere, you might find some different numbers for that. Um, but in the textbook, our textbook says three to two. So that's what we're gonna go with is that the strength ratio between those internal and external or medial and lateral rotators is three for the medial, two for the lateral. So medial is much stronger than the lateral rotators. All right, so now that's the glenohumeral joint. Let's talk about the shoulder girdle. So shoulder girdle, we said it includes the three joints, sternoclavicular joint, the cromioclavicular joint, and the scapulothoracic articulation. We spoke about the actions being that elevation, depression, protraction, retraction, and upward and downward rotation. Upward and downward rotation of the um, shoulder girdle occurs simultaneously with abduction and adduction at the glenohumeral joint because as we abduct and adduct the glenohumeral joint, look at the acromion here. If I just abduct this humerus, it's gonna get blocked. And what happens is the greater tubercle on the humerus actually comes into contact with the acromion. So if the, if the scapula or the shoulder girdle didn't work together with the glenohumeral joint, you wouldn't be able to abduct your arm very far because it would be getting stuck at that acromion. So what, hap what happens is that the um, glenohumeral joint abducts as the scapula upwardly rotates. So it allows for that action there. So they need to work together to allow for these ranges at the glenohumeral joint. So they're good friends working together always. Now, <clears throat> something interesting I mentioned before about the scapulothoracic joint was that it's not bone on bone here. The scapula does not touch the ribs and that's because there's muscles and connective tissue running between them. If we think about the muscles, that would be running between them. The first one is going to be our subscapularis. See the subscapularis, it starts on that um, anterior portion of the scapula. Um, so it runs on in between those two muscles. There's, I mean, those two bones. There's another muscle that also runs in between the ribs and the scapula, and that is the serratus anterior. So again, I don't have the full model here, but we can see the serratus anterior, the serrated edges. I call this one like the, um, the action star muscle. Like if you go and look up like comics of like Wolverine or like the Hulk or um, Superman, whatever you're into, you'll often see that the serratus anterior is drawn really um, obviously on, on the superheroes. So it's a superhero muscle. It's also the boxer's muscle, so it does punching. This muscle, I'll hold this to myself, runs up, 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 under the underarm and to the anterior portion of the scapula. So it's running in between the ribs and the scapula. You've got a good picture of it in your lab book, actually. So if you look at that picture, it looks confusing when we first see it. I'm going to explain it with you after you watch this video. Okay, now the next thing that we want to talk about 
is, I already really mentioned it, how the scapula and the humerus work together during abduction and adduction. This is called the scapulohumeral rhythm. So it's got a specific name on how these two bones work together um, called the scapulohumeral rhythm. So rhythm between the scapula and the humerus. Now, in terms of abduction and upward rotation, as we abduct the glenohumeral joint, for every two degrees of abduction of the glenohumeral joint, there's one degree of upward rotation at the scapula. So it's a two to one ratio. For every two degrees that the humerus abducts, the scapula upwardly rotates one degree like so. All right. Clem's gonna to talk to you about the next few pages to do with the range of motion testing. We're now just gonna go over the last um, station of the lab being the spinal contributions to shoulder motion. So when we move our glenohumeral joint, we can measure how much range we get at these joints being with the gyneometers that's, that Clem's going to explain next. She better not forget. Then, if you sort of want to trick your body and to get more range, you just get your back involved in it, right? So if I flex my shoulder and I keep a really nice neutral trunk, I can probably get to like maybe 170 degrees of flexion. But if I bend my back now, whoop, see, my shoulder goes much, much further back. So... On average, how many degrees can we flex and extend our glenohumeral joint? Well, we'll get those answers from the previous pages, which shows us the general averages of flexion and extension at the glenohumeral joint. And how do movements of the spine affect the function of the glenohumeral joint um, during adduction and abduction? Well, we just did an example for flexion. Let's talk about adduction and abduction. So as I abduct my arm, I can get to about here before I can feel it sort of pinching at the shoulder. If I want to get to this guy's head, all I need to do is bend my spine and then I can get there. So the trunk moves to allow more movement. And because sometimes at the shoulder girdle, not sometimes, but all the time, our range is really limited by some impingements of um, the different bony landmarks and ligaments at the glenohumeral joint, my trunk can compensate for that. All right, guys, let's get back into it.